Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fearlessly Authentic. I'm your host, Jody Harrison Bauer, and welcome to the show. If you are a first time listener, welcome. This is the place where we educate, empower you, entertain you a bit, and inspire you to live your most fearlessly authentic life. Because, in my opinion, what the heck are we doing here if we are not living our most authentic life? So, welcome to the show. You can find me on all platforms at Jody Harrison Bauer. And please remember to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. I am so excited about today's guest. She is going to educate you and empower you with that knowledge so you can go and live your best life. And it's a great, great guest to have on the show at the beginning of the year because so many of us struggle with what to eat, how much to eat. I have been in this business for over 40 years and everybody has their own way of breaking down what is important to eat and the mindset behind it. And Kim breaks it down, the mindset, the relationship with food, very, very specifically with her six steps, her six rules. And we are going to be discussing her book, This Is What You're Really Hungry For, Six Simple Rules to Transform Your Relationship with food to become your healthiest self. And a little bit about Kim before we bring her on to the show. Kim Shapira is a registered dietitian. She received her BS from Tulane University and her MS from Boston University with an emphasis in human metabolism and clinical nutrition. She has been in private practice for over two decades, taught nutrition at California State University, Northridge, and created the Kim Shapira Method. In her work with her clients, she realized that while losing weight is very important in one's health journey, having a healthy relationship with food was the most important component in keeping the weight off and finding sustainable health. And that is the key, everyone, sustainable health, not a quick fix. Kim uses her method daily with clients privately and in group sessions. Kim lives in Los Angeles with her husband, three daughters, and three fur babies. This is What You're Really Hungry For is her first book. Please welcome Kim to the show. Welcome to the show, Kim. I'm so happy to have you here. Thanks for having me. I'm also so excited to talk to you. Yeah, it's all. I loved your book. I have it right here with, look at this. Look at Look at this. Oh my gosh. Oh my it's gosh. Highlighted, dog eared. I mean, the whole thing. It's just, I felt like I was talking to a best friend. Perfect. That's exactly how I wanted it to be. Yeah. And for somebody who has been coaching women and, and men, but it seems primarily women, right? Yeah. I do. Um, I and and why is that? Do you just... actually no? That's not no. I wouldn't say that's a true statement at all. I see everybody in all ages. Actually, okay. Does it feel like I would see primarily women? I I think so. I felt yeah. that way from reading the book, and um, I know from when we previously talked, yeah, that we had so many things in common, yeah. But you do get into the mindset with your new book called This Is What You're Really Hungry For. And everybody, this is the name of the book. If you are struggling with understanding why you're eating, when you're eating, and everything to do with your relationship with food, Kim breaks it down so simply in this book. And uh, we are going to break it down and we're going to talk really honestly. And I am going to share what I did before we got onto the show, which was I had two bowls of cereal and I'm not a big cereal eater. And normally when I do interviews, I like to do them on a fairly empty stomach, sort of like when I work out, I like to work out on a fairly empty stomach. And that's so I don't feel like I need to throw up and when I'm working out or talking. And so- it just feels kind of weird to be doing it. And I ask him, I'm like, are you doing this interview on a fairly <laughs> empty stomach? And she's like, what? So yeah. um, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I guess I want to like interview you. Uh, <laughs> when you are full or satisfied, does it make you tired? Uh, when I'm full, I do feel satisfied and a little tired, but not necessarily because I do eat foods that give me energy, 
Yeah. So I don't feel sluggish afterwards, but I certainly okay. don't feel like lifting weights. Okay. Okay. You know, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I go ahead. Yeah. Because some people, as you know, and it's in the book that I talk about six simple rules all the time, but rule number two is to eat what you love and to make sure the food loves you back. And one of the symptoms of a food not loving you back is fatigue. Mm. And so I was just curious because I do know some people and I've heard many people say over the years, I don't eat very much during the day because then I crash. Oh. And so I just didn't know if that's where you were coming from because that then we can talk about, you know, inflammation. Yeah, no, no, I don't feel like I'm going to crash at all. But I do know after doing this show for almost four years now, I know how I want to feel. Yeah. Right. Just like when you're talking to clients, you know how you want to feel. And if you're super hungry, you know that more than likely you're going to be distracted. And you do talk about that in your book. But before we talk too much about what she talks about in her book, again, the name of the book is This Is What You're Really Hungry For. And it breaks down Kim's methods, six rules or methods that she goes by to help others have a healthier relationship with food and feel better overall because the mind and the body are so connected. We cannot disconnect them. No, they're the same. Um, I think they're like aligned perfectly. It's interesting because you and I are so similar in the way that we think. What What is your answer, do you think, for what you're really hungry for? Oh, I mean, when I tell you, I agree with 100% I know, of yeah. everything that you said. The only thing that I, it's not even a disagreement, is when you say eat when you're hungry. Yeah. For me, when I was getting ready for fitness shows, when I was prepping in that mode, um, I had to eat in yeah, order to lift weights. So whether I was hungry or not, I had yeah. to eat. And sometimes when I'm coaching my clients on eating for women, as you know, so many women do not understand how the right foods impact the way they feel overall, right. that at, some of them don't eat enough food at all, which is why they're always tired. Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Um, a lot of times I coach them on eat whether you're hungry or not, but it, I'm not talking about a big meal. I'm talking about grab a small piece of chicken or grab, I mean, it's usually not what people want to eat, but it is very good for you. And that's the heart. <laughs> and that that's where we differ a little bit is because yeah. I do put a lot of emphasis on getting enough protein in, but I do love your attitude. And I think as I'm getting older and I'm talking to more older women, my attitude has softened a bit. Mm. And, and I, yeah. do, I do like that. And the mindfulness, I do talk about that a lot too. So I want to first ask you, so my, so the listeners can understand who you are, how long have you been doing this and what was your vision for the method and for writing the book? Mm. I've been doing this, I think close to 27 years and my vision has always been to help people maintain their health. So I was a sick kid and all I wanted to do was be healthy. And somebody along my journey told me that food can make you sick or healthy. And so that was kind of like what I grabbed onto and wanted to study. And very early on, I recognized that people could lose weight, but they couldn't keep the weight off. And so I wasn't really able to help them stay healthy. And this was deeply triggering for me. And so as I started recognizing that my clients kind of eat the way that I shop mm. and started doing a little bit of a deeper dive into my own shopping habits. And I, re I related very much to that because I was previously married and I shopped when I was unhappy. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. I mean, I think I shopped for happiness, unhappiness, sadness mm -hmm. for all the things. I mean, who doesn't need something new and shiny? Right. Exactly. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so as I started kind of understanding that in order to really help my clients long-term, I needed to see more than just kale as being healthy or chicken mm. is really great for all the things that 
we need for, you know, maintaining our body. I mean, we need chicken, we need protein, right? right. But I couldn't get my clients to eat it long term, or they still wanted whatever it is they wanted to eat first. Mm. And then they were feeling shame about the foods that they were loving. So yeah. I needed to kind of help them figure out how to get a little bit healthier with themselves and stop sensationalizing food or even shopping. Right. Right. Yeah. And so that's, bec that became the six simple rules. The, you talk about shame and that word is thrown around a lot, but when we are with women who are morbidly obese, and I have a sister who is morbidly obese, and you want to help them so much, it's so important to get inside their head. Yeah. And that's that's the biggest part of being a coach, whatever in, in any area that you're coaching is to find out what the triggers are and we're going to get yes. into the triggers and what really motivates them as well and that's the hardest part about did you see that thumbs up that showed up <laughs> i don't know understand that happens on I the think show you gave a, a thumbs lot. up and it just like did i did it. I, don't I don't know, know. it's very weird <laughs> um some, yeah. some it must be my father so uh the shame is something you really feel for them and it's something that they they've carried their whole lives. Yeah. And I think you talk, I know you talk about so many of your clients in the book, but there was one that was talking, it was a young girl in the horror movies. Yeah. Um yeah. yeah. And um was that about shame or fear? It was your... fear about missing out on the other half of the food, really, right. right? About, I mean, there is so much shame and persecution in that person's yes. journey, and right. especially at such a young age. But mostly, it was a little bit of a trick to get me to watch a horror movie. And then when I did watch it, recognizing that the clown in the movie It really was very closely representing the food, right? And how it's when we the the idea of the horror movie, if you remember, if you've seen the movie, is this little girl is not supposed to talk to strangers. Mm -hmm. And so there's that same line with, we know what we're supposed to eat. Mm -hmm. And my rule for you is to eat when you're hungry, but to start with half and wait 15 minutes to see if you need more food, right? right. And then the clown comes in and she says, I'm not supposed to talk to strangers. And the clown says, well, I can help you. I can take away, you know, your ugly birthmark that you have on your face. And so this makes the little girl very excited. And so very similarly, when we think food is a good idea, especially when we have any pain or discomfort in our body, you know, we are very excited and become rewarded by whatever food is in front of us, forgetting that we weren't supposed to talk to strangers, that we weren't supposed to eat when we aren't hungry. Supposed to, all the rules that go along with what yes. we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to feel. Yes, the should. And, right, all the shoulds. All the and shoulds. One of the things that I read about you was your vision and you did this, you wrote the book with and came up with this because of your daughters. You have three daughters, Yes. right? And can you just share that a little bit with our listeners? Yeah. Yeah. You know, my mom has three sisters, so she's a fourth daughter. And I think she struggled in her own house growing up. And so when she, I mean, I know she did in a way where she was restricted or she was told that she needed to lose weight, things like that. And so when she became a mother, she did the opposite. She had an open pantry. She never once talked about her weight. She never shared anything about our weight. She never talked about our bodies. Mm -hmm. And we were never restricted from food. And I noticed growing up that my friends came over and it became like a smorgasbord, right? Like there was a free for all of food yes. that I didn't care about because I always right. had it. And so I wanted to kind of carry this tradition on with my daughters and it's, love, it's interesting. I mean, in some ways I've, I've overprotected them. Right. And I noticed it, you know, when my 20 year old went to college and she now was surrounded by eating disorders and 
she didn't, she didn't understand the fascination with the scale or restricting any sort of food group. And so that's what I mean. I overprotected her a little and right. Yeah. I had a similar and that I texted you about that. I had a similar experience growing up too. We had hostess Twinkies in the house. We had everything and people would come over and say, you have so much food in your house. Like, aren't you so excited to eat all this food? And I thought, mm, no, it's because it's always there. Yes. And it's um, because my mom had a weight issue and she, her mom restricted what she ate. So yeah. yes, at some point it needs to stop. So I love, I love that your daughters were your inspiration here. It's that's really beautiful. Yeah. All right. Let's break down. Let's get into this book. There is just so much great information. Rule number one. Yes. Eat when you're hungry. What does that mean? And how am I going to get healthy, thinner, gain muscle if I'm just eating when I'm hungry? Yeah. So our bodies give us signals all day long. It's time to go to sleep. It's time to drink water. It's time to urinate. It's time to eat. And this is when I talk about being in a relationship with your body, I'm really talking about honoring what it is you need when you need it. And so if it's just you and your body and the sensations you're feeling, if you ignore them, then your body feels stress. And this is an internal stress. And our body detects this internal stress or an external stress, right? In under 10 seconds, it triggers the hippocampus, the pituitary gland, and the adrenal gland. It then causes a spike in your cortisol, it changes your sex hormones, and it totally scurries, scurries up your blood sugars, right? And so when we ignore our basic needs, our body becomes stressed. And when we're in stressed, we are in fight or flight, and we cannot lose weight. Because our body is preparing for war, it's not going to give up weight. Right. By listening to your body and eating when you're hungry, your body says, I'm safe. I can give up what is stored. Mm -hmm. And by regulating your blood sugar, by eating every two and a half to three hours, we're securing our safety. If we overeat and we don't, and we're not hungry for many hours, our body then takes that message as save that for the winter. Right. Save that for if I'm a, on a, a stranded island and I need to literally live off the fat of my body. Yeah. Yeah. And if we under eat, our body says we're at war, save mm -hmm. everything. And, and women don't understand that. You see so many women and it probably drives you crazy and really want you to be honest with this. When you see all of these fads, and I know mm. both of us are not into any of the fads out there, of the the ridiculousness of intermat intermittent yeah. fasting. There is a place for it, but not on a daily basis because yeah. with everything, your body gets used to it. I always used to use um, the analogy of sex. If you're going to have sex the same way with your significant other, all the time, then eventually you don't look forward to it. It's not going to change. You're, everything's going to be the same. I don't know if you feel the same yeah, way. Yeah, that but makes sense. It just, right. So it's, you've got to, you've got to change it up. So if you're intermittent fasting every single day, your body's not going to have the same reaction it did when you first did it. And then I see people really not eating at all and coming to me and saying, I'm gaining weight. You're yeah. gaining weight because you're not eating. Yeah. So maybe you could expand on that a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, even, I mean, like you're saying, there is a place for intermittent fasting. Like, what is it really? Like we should be fasting after dinner, right? We should be not eating after dinner until breakfast. And that that's why it's is... called break the fast. <laughs> and it's a great long period. It could be 12 hours where our body is in recovery mode and actually Every cell at that point is actually going through a detox, right? We're sleeping, we're healing, and we shouldn't be focused on digestion. So a fast after dinner between dinner and bed, let's say three to six hours, perfect. And then you right. sleep seven to nine hours, and then you wake up hungry in the morning. And then if you eat every two to three hours, just enough for what you need right now, trusting 
that you can eat again, right? Because you're not restricting, you're not going on a fad, you're not taking anything away. So we're trusting right. Right. that we're going to eat again because yes. historically I have eaten at least 21 meals every week, my entire life. So mm -hmm. I can trust that I will eat again. And what happens in our body just increases its metabolism. We get hungry normally, our blood sugar gets even, and we give up what is stored. We don't need to actually fast. It's that simple, everyone. It really, it's that simple. It and simple, yeah. the diet industry has, I think, purposely complicated it. And so when you are fasting after whenever your breakfast would be, you're actually going into starvation mode. Yeah. And that's when your body is holding on to more fat yeah. and losing the lean muscle mass you need that's going to help protect you as you get older. Yeah. I mean, you should be like screaming that from the rooftops. We need muscle for yes. protection as we get older, for balance, for all of our organs, for everything, for endurance, to be able to carry groceries from the car to the kitchen, right. for walking down the street. Getting need... into your car, yes. like everything. Yeah. And, um, and I think that a lot of people, when they're younger, right? When, you, when you're younger, there's 30s, confusion. 40s, right. There is confusion. It's it's very confusing. And and I think it's really sad because I'm always been about sustainability and quality mm -hmm. of life and preventing disease. And if we look across the board at every disease, they are diet and nutrition related. Across yeah. the board, every disease, every disease. We cannot, there isn't one disease that is not diet nutrition related, which means the food you're eating is affecting your body and your body is made up of cells and organs and you have to take care of them. You have to. And so why not want to? So stop listening to all of the crap and just focus on what's going on inside of your body. Yes. Yes. Okay. So when we're, when you are eating only when you're hungry, let's get really nitty gritty on that. Okay. Before, so, before yeah, we on. even get to that rule, I'm going to be mm -hmm. even more annoying because I think before Please. somebody can even figure out if they're eating when they're hungry, they have to know where their mind is. Okay. And so then we have to kind of talk about those triggers that you kind of briefly talked about. And in our human experience, we develop between three and five emotional triggers in the first six years of our life, even in a loving home. Mm -hmm. Right. And so my three daughters are all going to have emotional triggers. I love them to pieces. I didn't mean for it to happen, but we got to give them something to work on. I know. I know. <laughs> I feel the same way. I'm right. like, I love you guys more than anything in the world, please. But right. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. But, and also when we go through something traumatizing, we develop a new trigger. So it could be 9 11, it could be the pandemic. For me, it could also be when I got sick in 1986, right? It, it was. I mean, my whole career is based on me wanting to be healthy and wanting to make everyone else healthy. So we develop these emotional triggers and we work on them until we master them, but we also can develop new ones. And so what happens when we get emotionally triggered, our mind jumps out of our body into a different moment. It can go backward. It can go forward. It can go on dinner next Thursday, conversation I had last week. It can go on my financials. It can go anywhere. But in order to actually follow these six rules, you have to know where your mind is and you have to have the ability to bring it back to this moment. And sometimes this moment sucks and we don't want to be here, mm -hmm. but we have to practice accepting the moment, trusting we have everything we need inside of us to survive the moment. And many people do not know what to do when they're in that moment and they use food to comfort them. Yes, because food is fun. Food is right. entertaining. Food is comfort. And it's a great distraction from the discomfort they feel in their body. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you do to help somebody recognize that trigger yeah. that they've gone to food for comfort? What can they do? And that's where all of yeah. the mindfulness comes in. Yeah. And, and the definition of mindfulness is really to know where your mind is without judgment, right? Mm -hmm. So just, you don't have to know why it's gone away. You just have to have the ability to bring it back. And so one quick thing you can do is to ask yourself what time zone your body is in. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's specific standard time. And then I have to, I can say what time zone is my mind in. 
And I can recognize it's not in the exact same moment as my body. And then I can repeat it until my mind comes back here. And sometimes if I'm very anxious, it jumps out, but I have the ability to bring it back. And so once we know where our mind is, then we can move forward through the rules. Okay. Yeah. I, I and, really and love that. Just like a really quick thing that I want to point out that's really helpful for some people is when they're in their home and their alarm goes off, nobody ignores the alarm. Everybody gets up and turns the alarm off. And then they scan their surroundings to make sure that they're safe. And then they go back and carry on with whatever they were doing. Every single time we have a thought, food is a good idea, we should all recognize it's an alarm going off and it means we're not okay. And I say that in quotes, we're not okay, mm -hmm. because it could mean that we're hungry. Mm -hmm. It could mean that we're stressed. It could mean that we're tired or bored or procrastinating or feeling some or other discomfort. But any time that you have a thought, I need, I want food or food is a good idea, it's a signal that we have to go turn the alarm off, scan our bodies mm -hmm. and figure out why our mind wanted to have a more pleasurable moment. Okay. I love that. And I, I could do it right. Mm -hmm. But the average person listening to you right now, not that you guys are average at all, but a person who's listening right now, who might be struggling, who doesn't have, who isn't in that aware minded fullness mode mm -hmm. right now, how can we get her there? Because that's a really uncomfortable thing to ask somebody to be really aware, especially when they don't want to confront the fact that they're dealing with something that is uncomfortable for them. Yeah. You know, it's like asking somebody to journal their food. They're like, no, not doing it, not yeah. doing it. I don't want to see what I'm thinking about or, or eating because it's just going to make me feel bad about myself. And there is the shame again, you know? Yeah. It comes back to the shame for sure, but it's also the clown, right? And remember the clown ends up eating the little girl in that horror movie. Yeah, I was horrified when I heard that because I don't watch horror movies. Me I was neither. like, I, I was, I was reading it. I was like, <laughs> I know, I'm sorry, I didn't mean. <laughs> it's terrible. I know it's terrible, but the thing is, is so the end. If the clown eats her, and if we think that food is is sensationalized or a reward, is it not the same as the same? It's not the same. It's not the same, of course. But in the same instance, it's kind of thinking I gave in to the clown. Why would I do that when I am like fearless, empowered, capable? Why can't I put the food on hold for 30 seconds, for one minute, put a little space between the thought to eat and the action to eat to recognize the hell's going on with my body? Mm -hmm. What is it I really need? And if any one of my three daughters walks into the room and they're like, mom, I'm really, really stressed. I would never tell them to go eat. I would say, let's take a deep breath. Let's see if we can work this out. Let's I'm sure this walk. is going to, yes. yes. Or just be here and feel the despair. Just feel it for one second. It's okay. But until we accept it, we can't actually move forward. Right. And that's where step one comes in. That's the only place it can come in is when you're in acceptance. Here I am. And this moment, I'm actually hungry in my stomach and it's not painful and it's not scary. And it does get louder if I don't feed it. Right. And, and something you said before about it's the same when we're talking about triggers, it's the same feeling slash trigger that you have like when you have to go to the bathroom. Yes. And you don't... So what happens when you're at, you know, you're at a Broadway show and you have to go to the bathroom and you, don't you know jump that up. nobody jumps jump up. up, right? Right. You <laughs> hold it in. Yeah. To, you know, I'm being really open here. You hold it in, Yeah. but it's, and while you're holding it in, it makes you really uncomfortable. Yeah. And it gets worse, right? Like the hunger right. gets worse. The bladder mm -hmm. gets fuller. Mm -hmm. And you, not... you might even start going into like a cold sweat because, you could. You, right. But at first you have a sensation in your bladder that then alarms your mind and your mind scans your body and says, I, I think I have about 15 minutes before this is going to become a problem. We can totally identify 
right. when we have to use the bathroom and when we have to hold it. We're capable. Right. And we do become more and more like narrow minded as our bladder fills and we can't think of anything else. Yeah. Then what's crazy is we pee and then we totally forgot we were uncomfortable because we have such short term memories. Right. And it's that way with food too. That way with food. We get so excited about what we're going to eat. None of us can remember what we ate yesterday, mm -hmm. last week. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, I know. So, and nobody woke up this morning thinking, oh my God, I'm going to have to pee six times and I need to know where those toilets are and what time I'm going to use them. I love that example. I love that. It is just, it really resonated with me. Yeah. And I'm, I was thinking I've, I've got to use that, but it's such a great way to think about it. You don't think like that. So you've, it's right. all about changing the way you think. So how do you teach people to eat when they're hungry and when they say, I'm not hungry or I'm hungry for chocolate chip cookies yeah. all the time. If yeah. you could talk and about And they do, that. and people do say right. that. First, I just have to tell you um, how this rule even came to be. I was running to Bloomingdale's. I was on the phone with my mom and I'm like, I got to go. There's a sale and I got to go. <laughs> and she said, Kim, Bloomingdale's has a sale every week. <laughs> And I was like, no, they do not have a sale every week. It's happening right now. And of course, this is like, you know, 20 years ago. Right. And then I was annoyed because she planted a seed in me. And I'm like, I got to actually now pay attention to Bloomingdale's. And then she was right. Of course she was and right. So she was your mother. She was right. Of course. And so the point is, is that when I started saying that to my clients and saying, you know, there's food on every corner, you know, we have food in our refrigerators, you know, that there's always food. It became this idea of, oh yeah, I'm starting to trust that I could get that on sale. Mm, I that love the sense. trust, right? That's a great way to think of it. I I trust there's food everywhere. I trust, trust there's it. a bathroom. There's probably more food. You can find more food than you can find bathrooms. Yeah. But, uh, right. But I've can... made it to a toilet every time I needed one. I think I have to. I mean, there's, I, sometimes I've gone in, you know, to the woods, whatnot, right. but like I've made it. Right. Right. So yeah. you don't need to fight it. You need to give into it. Yeah. What happens to the person who gives into it too much? When you say to them, eat when you're hungry. Well, Kim, I only want to eat chocolate chip cookies mm -hmm. and Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And yeah. well, licorice. the truth is, is I've never met anybody hungry for Ben and Jerry's ice cream or chocolate chips. Okay. If somebody is physically hungry and I have a turkey burger or I have chocolate chips, the hungry person is always going to pick the turkey burger. So that's the craving. It is a craving. Right. That's the craving. Right. So and we have cravings because, you know, sugar is a drug. And when we eat sugar, we become addicted immediately. And when we have withdrawals a few hours later, we right. get a craving and that is totally normal to have sugar, especially in 2024. I mean, there are birthdays and there are things where there is sugar around, right. but it is a habit to have it every single day. And, and I do know people who say, I have a piece of chocolate after dinner every single night. Yeah. And I say, okay. If it's just that one piece of chocolate every single night and you end it there, that is a habit. It's yeah. not going to really change anything because you're limiting the sugar. Um, but it's it it does become it's they're not eating the chocolate because they're hungry because they they're just not eating it their because meal. they're hungry. Right. They're not eating it because they're hungry. And right. so then I would offer them just the advice to be curious. So what I know to be true is that we fail when we think we know everything and when we neglect to do what we need to do. And if we can be curious, what happens if I don't eat the chocolate? What happens? Then we start winning, right? Because there could be a moment where you're actually like, I thought I wanted it, but actually my body was craving it, but I wasn't hungry and I mm -hmm. totally forgot about it. Right. Just right. be curious what happens. Nobody's saying no, but what about if we don't have it right now? What if we brush our teeth after dinner and we just go get immersed in something else and we 
we just see what happens, right? Right. But we can't always be hungry for chocolate. We're not. We're, We're not. not. No, and normal it's... eating is eating chocolate. Nobody's saying not to eat it, but it's right. not every day. Right. And so our you... mind will start craving it when we've had it. Our body will crave it. Right. It will continue to yes. crave it until the craving. And that's where sometimes the intermittent fasting helps because what it does is it, if you're fasting, depending on the kind of fasting you're doing. And I know you and I both agree with the whole, um, the the green mixes people eat for breakfast. Those, yeah, yeah, the those powders. Smoothies. Oh yeah. my goodness, oh my, they drive me crazy. <laughs> I had a smoothie. Great, good yeah. for you. Okay, yeah, I don't, yeah. I'm not into them either. So um, when somebody stops eating it and usually it's the sugar, what you find when people do a little yeah. bit of a fast is they get nauseated. Sometimes they vomit, headaches. Um, headaches. It's yeah, it's, moody. With, it's the withdrawals. Withdrawals. Like, yeah. They're having DTs and right. it takes about four days. Right. And then most cravings. people don't want to stop. Right. So there's that curious piece though, if you were to just to not have it for right. four days to see how badly you want it on day five, if you still love it after dinner, or if you just completely don't even want it anymore, right? Because it's not real. What you think you love is not actually a real thing. It's a craving. So how do you get into somebody's head and and guide them through that? Because I've been through that myself with clients and sometimes I'm successful, sometimes I'm not. And I also want you to talk about the 15 minute rule. Okay, so let me breeze through the rules to get to that one, to get to that point. So the rule number one is to eat when you're hungry, but it really requires you taking your normal portion, whatever you would normally eat, not what the chef has prepared, not what the label right. reads, but what you normally eat, and then cutting it in half, and then eating it slowly, really smelling your food, chewing your food, letting your body mechanically break down the food properly so it relieves you of digestive distress and you, you can digest it easier, right? And when we wait 15 minutes, it's actually the same thing as like that semi-glutide, what the semi-glutide does, right? Mm -hmm. It it speeds up the leptin. So you basically feel full faster. Right. We all as humans have this hormone leptin that tells us that we're satisfied. And it takes about 15 minutes from the moment we start eating until 15 minutes until our mind tells us we're satisfied. Right. So we should lean into that and wait 15 minutes, come back and check with the other half of that food to see if we need more. Some of us do sometimes, not all the time and not for every meal, but we're also able to go back to finish that meal or eat more of it as soon as we feel hungry, which should be about two and a half to four hours after we eat. So that's rule number one. It's long when you're hungry. No, no. How, how, but how does somebody identify whether or not they're still hungry? Because what people think is hunger is not necessarily hunger. Because yeah. as you said, put the portion out, then cut it in half. And most yeah. people might say, no, I'm going to still be hungry. No, you're not because you well, really don't need all that food. Depending, yeah. You know, unless you're a marathon runner or you're some type of doesn't professional even matter. athlete. Doesn't matter. Okay. We don't okay. know. We don't know we what don't anybody's know. Okay. feeling. Okay. Right. We cannot assume. All like right. I remember when my kids were young and I took a baby's first class and the teacher said, when your child falls on the sidewalk and they start crying, don't tell them it doesn't hurt because you can't see the tiny pebbles that got sucked into their skin. Right. Mm. I don't know what they're feeling. And so it's really got to be your personal relationship you feel with yourself. And if you're somebody who's never experienced hunger, that tells me instantly that you eat more than you need when you're eating and your body fat is too high. So when we have a lean body mass, we're hungrier, we're more active, we're more metabolically active. So it's, it's to me, simple, take your normal portion, cut it in half. Now FOMO is going to jump in and FOMO is fear of missing out. Yes. And it's going to jump in and say, but the, but it's still warm and it's delicious. Anytime we think food is anything other than fuel, we're not okay. And oh we God, have I love to, you. <laughs> <laughs> and we have to stop rationalizing bad ideas. So again, we got to go back to why is my mind telling me I need that food? Let me find my mind, scan my body and see if it's because I'm hungry or because I just think it's delicious. Mm. 
And if it's delicious, have it for the next 10 meals. I don't care, but don't overeat it right now in this moment. You can have it again. I promise. Right. And it's constantly reminding your mind I'm safe. I'm safe. Right. Cause that's what it wants to know at all times. Right. Right. And I'm thinking about that second bowl of cereal I ate before the show. You were hungry. You were I really was too hungry. hungry. And then it tasted so good because yeah. I was eating raisin bran and I never eat it. And I just had to have another one. But then yeah. I stopped myself because I felt, you know, I was more than, because I don't need a lot at each meal because I'm not, I'm all of five feet tall. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't need, you don't look much bigger than me. No, I'm not. Um, <laughs> and so um, I understand that. Do you find it very difficult to explain that to people? what you just explained to me. I, I don't. And I, and I, it's so funny. There's your dad I, again. I, there's my, yeah. There's my dad <laughs> again. Okay. I'm gonna put this down. <laughs> I don't, um, no, I just, I think when a client is in front of me and I have their statistics and I know their weight history and I know their body fat percentages, and I know how many steps they're moving and how active they are and what their sleep is like, I know when they're you know, being authentic and, and what it, what it's like for them. So we all have a history and I know that this is a, a really hard thing, but again, FOMO is, is one of those things. Like it, if, if you're looking at this and you're watching, like our rational mind knows food is fuel. That means we're emotionally sound. I'm rational. I'm here with you now in this moment, I'm grounded. When I'm irrational when I've been triggered emotionally. And it could just be because you're talking to a dietitian. It could be because we're talking about a half portion and you're totally scared. I'm taking away the other half. I'm not, I'm not, you're safe, right? But when you're emotionally triggered and you become irrational, we then think food is comfort. Food is entertainment. Food is fun. Food is the enemy. Anytime you think food is anything other than fuel, your alarm is going off. Guess what? We need to breathe. We need to breathe. I right? I love that we we talked about this so long because it's really important for everybody listening to understand it. Now, the, rule number two is eat what you love. Yes. It's eat what you love with a caveat. Make sure the food loves you back. So Again, I'm a registered dietitian. I know that almost every disease is related to food. And I want you to have as many fruits and vegetables as I can get inside of your body, right? I want you to have whole grains and all the proteins that are lean, all the things that you need. The problem is, is that many people think that something is healthy or unhealthy, or they should, or they shouldn't, or it's good or it's bad. And those are getting in the way of people doing what they should be or what they need to be doing in their own bodies, right? So eating what you love is permission to eat anything you want mm -hmm. when you're hungry and you start with half, as long as the food does not give you a headache, make you clear your throat, make your nose run, make you have heartburn, make you bloated, nauseous, gassy, smelly or airy gas, constipated, diarrhea, itchy skin, psoriasis, joint pain. If your diet and your body does not feel any of those things, go for it. But if you're feeling any of those symptoms, we need to take a deeper look at your relationship with food and why you would stay in a relationship with foods that are making you sick. I, that's perfect. Yeah. That's perfect. Why would yeah. you be in a relationship with food that's making you feel sick? Right. Period. That's it. Right. Done. Then we have okay. to do some healing. And so then we'll heal you in certain, you know, with whatever it's going on with your gut, whatever inflammatory issues you're having, then we'll try adding back these foods. And at that point you may want them or not want them, mm -hmm. but by restricting them, you're setting yourself up for a binge. By understanding mm -hmm. that foods can make you sick or healthy really allows you to grow. Again, there's that acceptance. And in the book, I do talk about Olivia again, my 20 year old, where she would go to the mall and always ask for a pretzel. And, mm -hmm. you know, somewhere in, I was cringing a little bit 
And <laughs> then, you know, I would say, fine, get, get the pretzels, whatever you want. And then she would say, you know, mommy, I have a stomach ache. And I said to her, gosh, I wonder if it's those pretzels. Why don't you try eating half next time and see if you still get a stomach ache? And she did. And she did get a stomach ache. And she decided at a very young age, those pretzels are not good for my body. No, thank you. Mm -hmm. It was never, you can't have that, Olivia. That's not healthy. This is bad for you. It was, tell me what your body needs. And she right. has. Right. And it's it's not about restriction and it's not about food is bad. Right. Those are, and I think so many older people, maybe my age grew up with that. And maybe there are a lot of people your age and younger that still haven't learned that and are still taking the things from how they grew up and teaching those things to their children, which is why we're still battling yeah. obesity and relationships with food, you yeah. know, or anorexia, you know, yeah. the opposite. Um Eating without distraction. You talked about grabbing the food, half your portion, eating, enjoying it. And I was thinking, but not in front of the TV, right? Exactly. Right. <laughs> so many people look forward to the end of the day when all the kids are asleep, when they're alone, treating themselves is how they would have referred to it, which is to me the opposite of treating themselves, mm -hmm. um, especially because they're full of shame and persecution about their health and weight. So eating without distractions means eating the food you love, but being with the food you love, right? Why do we say we love food, but we can't be alone with it, mm. right? That's so to remove point. the distractions, the computers, the books, the TVs, be alone with your food. Of course, you could be with your family members, but if you really love it, be with it, you know, see if you really do love it. And the truth is, is that food is really, really boring. And yes. after a few bites, we want to do anything but be alone with our food. And so then we really have to question, why are you eating? Yeah, I guess, you know, if we thought about it with relationships, as you mentioned before, like the toxic food, toxic relationship, if you're in a relationship with somebody you don't want to be alone with, then maybe you shouldn't be alone with that person, right? right? I would say so. Right. Yeah. If you need to always be out with other couples or doing something active, then maybe this isn't the person for you. Probably. You're right. Exactly. Oh. Yeah. 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 So like just that. be alone with your food and, you know, see, see how much you like it. Okay. What about the, your rule number four, walk 10,000 steps a day. There it's there. There's a lot of conversation about that, but why is this important to you? Yeah. So the average American gets about 3000 steps. The golden number is 7,000 is mm -hmm. what we need for almost everything to improve our health. It decreases our risk from almost every disease and Alzheimer's, including Alzheimer's. But what I would say is that I've noticed that my clients cannot maintain their weight loss without moving at least 10,000 steps. So 10,000 steps is going to help you sustain your health improve your emotional well-being and your digestion and your sleep and your hormone balance. So although we need to move at least seven, I think it's 10. And I did say like probably steps, but I really do mean move. So, you know, even if you and I were talking with our arms, this is mm -hmm. for our hands, this is better than just sitting. Because when we go from walking around, our metabolism is 100%. When we go to sitting, it goes to 30%. Mm -hmm. But even just doing this, Right. counts. My arms don't know if I'm walking or what I'm doing, right? We need Movement. to be active. Yeah. So in any way that you can. Yeah. And I think maybe that was um, marketed a certain way to get people to move. And it was definitely something great. I know that I do not, I live in the suburbs. I do not take 10,000 steps a day. When I visit my daughters, you know, in their big cities where they live, you know, I was in New York for a week and I was doing over 10,000 steps a day. And I said to my daughter, how many steps do we take? She goes, it was only 6,000 today, mom. I'm like, oh, if I looked at my average, it's nothing, but I work out for two hours every day. Right. You know, I'm lifting weights. I'm running on a treadmill. I'm spinning. I'm doing something like that six days a week. Yeah. So I don't beat myself up when I hear people go, so how many steps do you get, Jody, Miss Fitness person? I'm like, not 10, not seven, but I'm doing other things. But I will say that when I was walking, I loved it. Yeah. It was great for my mind. Yeah. Nobody doesn't love it. It's just hard starting. Yes. But it's very, but 
I would disagree that you don't get more. I don't think all of your actions count, but there, you probably are getting way more than 10,000 steps, to be honest. I know. I think I am too. But you know, when you look at your phone, it doesn't say that. So it's like, mm -hmm. you yeah, know, I, I wouldn't worry about it for one second. Somebody who's working out for two hours is yeah. definitely surpassing. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, but I loved what it did for my mind and it was, it was really, really lovely. And I felt like it was a big accomplishment. Um, drinking eight cups of water daily. Yeah. Explain to everyone why that is so very important. Yeah. And I call this the secret sauce, right? So if mm -hmm. we don't drink enough water, then our other organs, like, well, first of all, water helps filter all of our toxins, but most importantly, it helps the kidneys filter out the mm -hmm. toxins. And if we don't drink enough water, our liver kind of has to jump in and take over the kidneys job. And so our liver's job is to metabolize fats. And so if it's doing the kidneys job, we end up storing fats. So just by drinking water, we're helping our body with our body fat and our triglycerides and our cholesterols. So it's really important, not to mention it also helps almost every single cell detox. And we have like a hundred trillion cells. So really kind of important to Do drink water. I've noticed with some people that get who don't drink enough water, get headaches. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. and uh, they feel, and the when they start drinking more water, they have less headaches. They feel less sluggish, sluggish. Yeah. And yeah. I think it because it helps so much with digestion, right? With with detoxing, right? So right. one percent one percent dehydration, which is about two cups of water, mm -hmm. makes you feel like you have the flu. So if you think about it, I always am the type of person who thinks what's out is in. So we're mirroring what's out in our bodies. Mm -hmm. Um, energetically and physically, and we're surrounded by oceans and by waters and our body should be at least 50%, 60% water. Right. And so we really need to focus on that to feel better. Helps everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And those are, we have one more rule. One more. I'll go through it fast. The last no, one no, is, no. yeah, this is, this is, is like the sleep. best one. And yeah. <laughs> It's an important one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, the average person gets about six and a half hours. We need between seven and nine. And there are a zillion sleep issues. People have problems falling asleep, staying asleep and waking up very tired. And we really need to be on a sleep schedule so we can fall asleep at the same time, wake up at the same time and not hit the snooze button. When we change our sleep schedule, even by an hour, it's like going from Colorado and to, you know, Midwest, whatever, it doesn't matter wherever we're traveling, but one hour time change is jet lag. And mm -hmm. that jet lag actually makes us have more inflammation and makes us have poor decision ability. So we start doing things like eating foods that we wouldn't normally eat. Mm -hmm. we, we might pass on going to the gym that day. Maybe we have extra coffee to help us. So by getting a more sleep and a regular sleep schedule, we actually are lowering inflammation because melatonin, which is the hormone that cleans our cells is, is working properly. So it's very, very important to focus on getting good sleep. And if you're having any problems falling asleep, staying asleep or waking up unrested, you definitely need to talk to somebody about it. And it is something that so many women struggle during menopause. Oh my gosh. And post-menopause. I don't know where you are. Yeah, I'm um, in it. I'm in it thick. In, yeah. You're in it thick. Okay. Yeah. And so I started having sleep issues while I was going through menopause. And Man. now finally it seems to be going away because I worked really, really hard at creating a sleep schedule. Yeah, it's important. And even my husband like said, where are you going? I go, I'm going to bed. Yeah. I told you this is when I'm going to bed. I'm yeah. going to bed now yeah. because it takes me a while to like, once I say I'm going to bed to then take myself down because if yeah. I keep myself up past say 10 o'clock, yeah. I'm up for, up, I'm up until two. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get it. You know, when um, you're putting a baby on a sleep schedule, they always say, if you miss that window, then they have a hard time going to sleep. And so we have a window ourselves. And mm -hmm. when we start feeling drowsy, that's when we need to go to bed. And right. Yeah. It's, and you know, if you aren't sleeping well, then that actually increases your internal stress and that actually causes weight gain. So we can't lose weight if we're not sleeping. And one of, uh, you know, when I started in the fitness business, I remember a coach that I was working with said to me, this is, this goes back over 35 years ago, 
that your sleep and the rest is just as important as yeah. that workout and yeah. as that meal you're going to eat. And that has stayed with me and obviously yeah. learning what I've learned along the way. Yes, it's so important. Everybody listening, these tips are everything. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing them. How can people get in touch with you, Kim? They can find me everywhere at Kim Shapira Method, either kimshapiramethod.com or everywhere. Buy, buy the book, everybody. Please buy the book. It's called This Is What You're Really Hungry For, Six Simple Rules to Transform Your Relationship with Food to Become Your Healthiest Self by Kim Shapira. She is amazing. You are amazing. So are um, you. Thank you. This, That's very sweet of you. This was so fun. I loved having you on the show. Um, I know that everybody is taking, and that what a great time of year, the beginning of the year to have you on for everybody sort of change their mindset. Can people work with you one-on-one? -on -one? Do you yes. coach people? Yes. I see clients privately in groups and I have a class okay. that's available for people to do it in the privacy of their own homes as well. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kim Shapiro, for being on the show. Thank you. Such a pleasure. And for everybody listening, please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. You can find me on Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple, uh, and you can find me on all social platforms at Jody Harrison Bauer and on YouTube. So you can watch this show on YouTube, but not when you're driving your car. And until next week, go live your most fearlessly authentic life. And I'll see you soon. Bye-bye, everyone.